morning and thanks for taking the time out to join us whatever day of the week you're doing this or from wherever you're doing it. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Uh, unfortunately, we can't meet again still here uh, where we are in the state of New South Wales in Lismore. We can't gather uh, in our building, but that's okay. Praise God, we have the technology available and the platforms available that we can still come to you uh, wherever uh, you are. So thanks for joining us. Um, if you're somebody that has been joining us regularly and you're uh, feeling like you're growing in your faith, you're enjoying what you're hearing here at Arise Online, then why don't you hit that subscribe button there, make it easy for you to be notified when we do upload uh, new services and so on. Um, and if you think that today's message or anything else coming out of Arise Online is a blessing to you and you know somebody else that might be blessed by it, why don't you hit the share button and flick it across to them. Uh, also, again, if you have any prayer requests, we have a team of people at Arise here that love to pray. They love to lift your needs up to God. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. There should be an email address on the bottom of your screen there. We'd also love to hear your praise reports. It's always good when God answers prayer to share that with other people. Nothing builds faith more than hearing the activity of God in somebody else's life. And finally, let me say a big thank you to uh, our Arise Church family uh, for your generosity and uh, your uh, continued tithing and giving to church. Even though we can't make it uh, and gather together, uh, you've still been very faithful using our uh, bank details and online and so on. So we just want to say a very big thank you for, uh, for your uh, generosity and uh, for your contribution to what we're trying to do here at Arise. Uh, having said that, why don't we just uh, go and join Daniel. He's going to lead us in a song of worship. Like a river wash over me Immerse me in water as deep as the sea And hide me in love, your healing embrace like a river wash over me as I worship your majesty I worship your holy name Jesus my everything and all that I am is your and come Holy Spirit rain down on me break open the heavens Drench the unseen And pour out your presence So pour out your praise And come Holy Spirit And Lord have your As I worship your majesty, I worship your holy name, Jesus, my everything, and all that I am is yours. I worship your majesty. I worship your holy name, Jesus, my everything, and all that I am is yours. And I am
Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. A move of your spirit. Heaven break out. Come now in power. Cover this land like you've done it before. Would you do it again? Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. A move of your spirit. Heaven break out. Come now in power. Cover this land like you've done it before. Would you do it again? Lord, send revival, Lord, send it now, a move of your spirit, heaven break out, come now in power, cover this land, like you've done it before, would you do it again, heaven break out, heaven break out. Grab a Bible, and if you don't have one, hit pause, go grab one. I want you to make sure that what I'm saying to you is actually coming out of this uh, collection of ancient documents. Make sure I'm not leading you up the garden path. So why don't you grab a Bible, or if it's on your tablet or iPhone or whatever, uh, why don't you go with me to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to uh, wrap up, tie up what we've been talking about for the last uh, four weeks. This will be our, our fifth week. And what we've been talking about is, is what it takes to walk on water. And we're looking at the story of Peter walking on water. Now, we could preach on this for the next 20 weeks. There are so many uh, facets and angles and uh, cultural uh, stories and, and uh, narratives and analogies we could bring out of this story, but I'm just trying to, to keep it to things that are necessarily perhaps relevant or accessible to you and to me, the average person, 2021, living uh, in the world that we live in. Uh, how can we walk on water? What does it mean to walk on water? For me, walking on water just simply means being the person I'm meant to be and doing the things that I'm meant to do. I'm me, I'm not you. And you're you, you're not me. And the things that I'm called to do and created to do are the things that are, uh, are I'm custom built for. They're not the things you're custom built for. You're custom built for other things. And uh, the thing is, as we go on in our journey with God, as we connect with Him, we, we discover who we are, we discover who He is, and then we discover what it is that He wants to do through us and how He wants to use us down here to make a difference, to glorify Him and to build the kingdom of God. So we've been looking at some of those characteristics and I want to sort of tie it up, I guess, with what I personally believe is maybe the biggest characteristic and the biggest thing that we could take out of this uh, story. And it's this, the fifth characteristic I want to talk about is that people who walk on water, they have faith in God, really. They have faith in God, really. Now I'm adding 
really because the really means let's stop and think about that first before we just spit out the pat answers that we have been trained to spit out or the things that we've heard or the things that we've always said. But it's a time to really think. And people that walk on water are people who have faith in God, really. Let's have a look at the story again in Matthew chapter 14. We'll pick it up in verse 26. And when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were troubled. They sang, it's a ghost. Uh, please don't think ghost in 2021. They weren't thinking ghost or like ghostbusters, that kind of a ghost. Uh, the word literally meant an apparition or a specter or, or, or it literally meant an appearance, uh, some appearance of something that was outside the normal. So please don't go thinking ghosts and zombies like all the, the, the popular uh, TV shows and things like that of the, the, uh, the 21st century. We're not going there. Um, and so they see this ghost and it says that fear fell upon them. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it's I, do not be afraid. When Jesus said to them, it is I, it's an interesting phrase. It's, it's directly in line with the phrase that God used in the Old Testament. If you go back to the Old Testament and we have the story of Moses. And Moses uh, is, is uh, raised in Egypt. He's raised in a, in a, in a place of privilege. He kills uh, an Egyptian one day for mistreating a Jew, thinking that the Jewish nation would realize he was the one that God was raising up. If they didn't get the picture, the next day he comes into town and someone has a go at him. He realizes that, they know what happened. He's going to get in trouble. He flees Egypt and spends 40 years in the backside of a desert. One day as he's, he's walking along, he sees a bush. And we all know the story. The bush is on fire. And he turns and he approaches the bush. And the language that God uses, I am, in the bush. It's the exact same type of language that's being used here. So when Jesus is saying, uh, uh, don't fear, it's I, it's the same scene being painted and the same sense of amazement and that same communication of, of who Jesus is that Moses was receiving in the burning bush. It's a massive moment and it's a massive theological statement that Jesus is making here as he walks across the water. He says, I am, it's I, don't be afraid. And Peter answers and says, uh, if it's you, Lord, then command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus says, come. And Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, truly you are the Son of God. Truly you are the Son of God. Let me just quickly pray. Lord, would you open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say? God, would you open our eyes to see what you want us to see through your word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, often when we, we read this story, we, we give it all kinds of different slants and angles, and that's exactly what we've been doing over the last few weeks. But when I look at the big picture, let me just make this statement to you. The story is not about Peter's, uh, about the disciples' fear, although that is definitely an element of the story. The disciples see him coming, and they're in a boat, in a storm, and it says that they were afraid. There's an element about that, and we can draw that out and expand on that. The story is not about being in a storm, although that's definitely an element. And you'll hear many messages about being in a storm, and I'll preach about being in storms and so on. The story is not about walking on water, though that's a very real element of the story. Peter getting out of the boat and walking on water, that's a, a valid application and there's things we can learn out of that. But the core of the story is not about any of those things. And it's not about Peter's lack of faith either. What it's actually about is a continued revelation of who Jesus is in the eyes of not only Peter, but in the eyes of the rest of of those disciples. When Jesus says to Peter, uh, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's not the faith that he's focusing in on, it was the object of Peter's faith that he's focusing in on. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt me? And that's an interesting question, isn't it? Why did you doubt God? Why would you doubt the creator of the universe? Why would you doubt? the God that loves you so much. And I want to, I guess, pose that question to us because we're not much different to Peter, are we? And I want to ask you the question, and I want you to think about it in those moments of your life. Why did you doubt? 
Why did you doubt? You know, we're going through a, a, a pretty hairy situation at the moment and nobody's enjoying lockdown and, and you know, we're not really, it's not a natural environment for us. Uh, uh, we're not getting to connect with other people. We're not getting to go out and do the things that we do. It's an unnatural environment for us. Uh, our environment has changed, uh, but God hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. Let me, let me, let me just say this to you. It's, it's funny. It's funny that we believe in a God who heals the sick. We believe in a God that can open blinded eyes and everyone hands up if you believe in that kind of a God, a miracle working God, I do. We believe in a God that cleanses lepers. He can cleanse uh, lepers, not, not just the, the, the imagery of leprosy as a sin, but talking physical leprosy. This is what Jesus did when he was here and is still doing around the world, healing signs, wonders and miracles. We believe in a God that calms raging storms and maybe in your world you've had storms calmed before and you've got testimony of storms being calmed. We believe in a God that walks on water. We're seeing in this very story here Jesus walking on water we believe and follow a God who raises the dead he, he removes the stone and says uh, to Lazarus Lazarus come forth and he does he himself was raised from the dead we, we believe in a God who loves humanity so much that he allowed himself he surrendered himself to the humility to, to, the, to the, 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 the process of, of being crucified on a cross it says in John 3:16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so Jesus gave himself up remember Jesus said I could call upon legions of angels right now and get myself out of this situation but because of intense love for people like you and people like me because of intense love for the jailers the ones that that paraded him through the streets, his love for the guys that held onto the hammers that drove the nails into his hands and his feet, his love for the crowd that were there, not only the ones weeping, but the ones who were mocking him and spitting upon him and couldn't care less and probably thought this is a great day, Jesus is gone. His intense love for all those people is what drove him to that cross. Because of his love, for humanity, he went through what he went through. I mean, that's an awesome God. I've just painted to you a picture of God. This is the God that we serve. Healing, delivering, setting free, loving, forgiving. This is an awesome God, a God that can do anything that he chooses, anything that he wants. Yet when something doesn't go our way, or we don't get the result we want, or our life becomes uncomfortable, we lose the peace that we found in the God of all I just mentioned. Isn't that funny? You see, we're just like Peter. One minute we're walking on water, trusting God, thinking that we've made it, maybe thinking we're further along the faith journey than we actually are, and then all of a sudden we begin to sink, <laughs> and reality kicks in for us. How many of you feel like I'm reading your mail right now? <coughs> How many people feel like I might be looking straight into your heart and the pressure, the intensity, the disappointment perhaps of lockdown, of not being able to get out and do what you want to do, the, the thinking that, that we were going to get an announcement here and we didn't and now all these things that happen in life. When, when we're on top of the mountain, we're loving God, we're believing God and we think, we, we think that we've kind of made it. We think that, that we've, we understand faith, we we've understand God. We think, But then as soon as something happens that disrupts that flow, how quickly do we move into doubt and we forget who God is and what God's capable of because we're not seeing the outcome or we're not getting the result or we're not in a place where we're uncomfortable all of a sudden. And how quickly do we lose the peace of God in those moments? It's interesting. You see, we're all like Peter. Peter is not unique in the sense that we can all walk on water for a moment, but we all tend to sink as well. All of a sudden, we begin to see God through the lens of our circumstances instead of looking at our circumstances through the lens of who God is. Can you think of a moment like that in your life? Maybe you're going through it right now. Well, let me ask you the question, who is God to you, really? If I just say, who is God to you, we can all just spit out, well, he's the savior of the world. He's the one that gives me peace. He's the one that answers my prayers. He's my provider, Jehovah Jireh. He's my healer. He's all these things. But who is God to you, really? Here's the thing. I think we find out who God is to us, really, more when we're sinking than we do when we're walking on top of the water. A.W. Tozer once said this, and if you haven't 
If you don't know who he is, you need to find out who he is. He's a fantastic author, wrote some of the greatest uh, uh, books about the character and nature of God that I've personally ever read. And A.W. Tozer said this, he said, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let me say that again. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to your mind when you think about God? Is it different when you think about God on a mountaintop than when you think about God in a valley? What comes to mind about who God is, his character, his nature, does it change in your mind depending upon your circumstances and your situation? Hey, I'm not here having a go at anybody if you're sitting there nodding going, yes, what I'm saying is I think that's all of our stories. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus knows that and God's okay with that. He's not here to condemn us. He's not here to say that there's something wrong with us or we're second-rate Christians. Personally, I think the day we admit that is a glorious day in heaven because from the, from the moment that we admit that, that gives us a platform from which we can really begin to develop true intimacy with God. Not just know stuff, but really begin to experience intimacy and grow in relationship with the creator of the universe. Our revelation of God will change as life goes on. But God himself never changes. Think about that. Your understanding of God, your comprehension of God will change as your life goes on, as you go through experiences and, 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 and gain understanding and so on. Your understanding of God. I've often said stuff I preached 10 years ago, I wouldn't preach it today because my understanding of God has changed. My understanding of God has evolved. But here's the, 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 the I guess the anchor is this. While my understanding might change, God himself never changes. God himself never changes. Who God is, is who God is. And that's good because that means no matter what you're going through right now, God is the complete package, if I can put it that way. You ever heard that term? He's the complete package. You're not the complete package. I'm not the complete package. I don't know anybody who is the complete package. My wife comes close. But I don't know anybody that is the complete package. But God's the complete package. He's a complete package. It doesn't matter whether you feel like he is or you feel like he isn't, he is. It doesn't matter whether you believe or you don't, he is. It doesn't matter whether you're aware of it or you're not, he is. Isn't that awesome? God is that stable rock in our life that doesn't change. God was the same pre-COVID as he is in the midst of COVID, as he will be at the end of COVID. COVID will change you and me. It may change society. It will transform the way we see things and what we do. COVID won't change the creator of the universe. It won't change God. So there's moments where you're on top of the mountain and you're really enjoying God and believing God and trusting God. You're walking on the water like Peter and you have a vision, a picture of God. That's the same God that's with you when you're sinking. Our vision may change. Our perspective may change. So here's what happened to Peter. Peter's posture changed. One minute he's walking on the water, next minute he's sinking. His posture changed, but God didn't change. Jesus was the same next to him as he was walking on the water as he was when he was sinking. Jesus was the same. He didn't change. Isn't that awesome? Jesus didn't change. Peter's focus changed. One minute he was looking at Jesus, then he was focused on the wind and the waves and all the other stuff. But guess what? Jesus didn't change. Peter's focus may change. Jesus doesn't change. Your focus may change depending on what's going on around you. You may feel really connected and intimate and you're doing everything right and you feel like, but then you lose focus on God and you don't feel so connected and intimate. Hey, Jesus hasn't changed. Isn't that awesome? God hasn't changed in that moment. Peter's emotions may have changed. He may have went from being really excited as he walked on water to all of a sudden filled with fear when he realized what was actually going on. But Jesus didn't change. He was the same when Peter was excited as he was when Peter was fearful. Peter's attitude may have changed. He may have gone from very optimistic at first. Hey, I'm walking on water. I'm doing what Jesus said. And as he began to sink, maybe he became a bit pessimistic. Oh, What's happening, God? Why, are, why am I sinking? What's wrong with me? What's, wh- where are you? What's... Peter's attitude may have changed, but Jesus didn't change. God didn't change. But the most important thing is that as the story goes on, I believe that Peter's revelation of God would have changed. Peter's understanding of God would have changed. 
And that's the joy of the Christian journey is that as we go on, our understanding of God, our, our, our vision of God expands and we get a fuller and fuller picture of who God is. And here's what I've learned about the difficult times of life. I want to give you a couple of thoughts. Here's what I've learned about the difficult times of life. Number one, difficult times of life, they help show me who I really am, not who I think I am. Anyone relate to that? Ever, ever have a vision of yourself, a picture of yourself? Ever, ever run through a scenario and go, if I was either, ever in that situation, this is how I'd handle it. But then one day you find yourself in that situation and, well, you don't really handle it the way that you envisioned you would or the way that you thought you would or the way you told everybody else you would. You see, we've all got a picture of who we are, a vision of, 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 of what we're capable of and what we're not capable of and, and uh, how we would react and respond and what's appropriate. We've all got that picture of, of, of who we are. But isn't it interesting that, that when you're under pressure, that's the moment where you get to see the disconnect, perhaps, between who you really are and who you think you are. It's in those moments of pressure, when the pressure comes, when the hard times come, when you're in a boat and the wind and the waves are beating, or when you're standing on the water one minute and then you begin to sink. It's in those moments of pressure that the real you comes to the surface. And you get to see who you really are. And sometimes that's not who you thought you were. So pressure gives us an opportunity to see who we really are. And the second thing pressure does is it helps me, it, it helps show me who I believe God really is. Not who I think I think he is, but who I really believe he is. Who I really believe. Do you remember the story of Peter and and Jesus is talking about, um, you know, being, uh, unless you, you come follow me, you lay down, take up your cross and, 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 and die and so on. And then uh, Jesus goes on. He's talking about how he's going to be taken by uh, the, the Romans. He's going to be, be, be killed. And, and Peter grabs a hold of him. Peter makes this statement. Peter says to him, this, this, this isn't going to happen to you. Peter goes on and says, I will die for you, Jesus. Everybody else is going to run, but I'm going to die for you, Jesus. Remember that? I'll die for you, Jesus, even if they take off. And Jesus looks him in the eye and says, Peter, a rooster's going to crow. <laughs> and you're going to deny me three times. There's a disconnect between who Peter thinks he is and who God knows he is. There's a disconnect between who Peter thinks he is in that moment and who God knows Peter is. Peter says, this is who I am. I'll die for you. God is looking at him going, no, you won't. You'll run. That's the real you. But here's the thing. God still loves the real you, and he still loves the real me. Here's a picture of Peter. Peter thinks he knows who he is. He thinks he knows who he is. I'm the guy that will die for Jesus. That's how committed I am to him. That's me. I'm a man of principle. I'm a man of, of faith. I'm a man of power. That's how he saw himself. Turns out that wasn't who he really was. God saw who he really was. And in that moment of pressure, Peter had an opportunity as the rooster crowed to go, oops, there's a disconnect between, between who I thought I was and who I really am. And God already knew that. God already knew it. He also thought that he knew who God was. Jesus is the one that I would die for. My faith is so strong. He's the one I would die for. Well, you would, you, not only would you not die for him, you denied you even knew him in the presence of some little girl. Think about it. He thought his faith was at this point but it wasn't, and God already knew that. He thought he was this person, but he wasn't, and God already knew that. And God allows situations sometimes and circumstances and pressures because what they do is they, they, they bridge the gap, the disconnect between who I think I am and who I really am. And it, it bridges the gap, the disconnect between who I think God is and who God really is. And unless we see the gap and the disconnect, we continue to live basically, I guess, uh, fantasy because God deals in realities and God knows reality sometimes we don't want to see reality but God will allow pressure and difficulties at times to show us reality here's the thing God loves you as you really are God loves you as you really are right now warts and all I don't care whether you feel like you've got faith to move a mountain or you feel like you've got no faith and you're riddled with doubt. God loves you right now as you are. And you need to know that he accepts you as you are. He loves you as you are. But he's going to continue to take you on a journey where he, he'll, he'll allow things to happen so you can see who you are, accept who you are, and move forward and grow 
into the person he wants you to become. He's going to allow you to see where your faith is really at. Not so that you can feel condemned or down or kick yourself or beat yourself or compare yourself to others. He just wants you to see where your faith's really at so you know the next step to take so that you can grow, so that your faith is something that's real, not just some kind of fantasy. Because God wants you to be who you authentically are and God wants you to grow in real faith. That's what he wants. And here's the thing I've learned in life. I learn more about myself and God in difficult times than I ever have on top of mountains. When things are going good, I don't self-reflect. I don't necessarily ask the tough questions. I don't self-examine. I don't feel the need to press in to God and to listen for solutions because everything's going great for me. But when things are not going great, life's a little bit different, isn't it? There's something about the pressure. There's something about the, 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 when life's not always going our way that we get an insight, a window into the truth, the true reality of who we are and the true reality of who God actually is to us. Here's a thought. Is it possible that the sinking was just as important a part of Peter's journey as the walking? What if, sometimes I think when we read this story, we assume that, that the, when, when, when Peter began to sink, that when Jesus says to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? We read that as some, a statement of disappointment, don't we? We read that as, oh, Jesus looking at him going, oh, Peter, why did you doubt? You got such little faith, why did you doubt? You started to sink when you, why? As if Jesus himself was thinking, oh, he's going to make it. He's, oh, maybe Peter's going to make it. Oh, I'm disappointed. He said, Jesus knew he was going to sink. And what if the sinking was just as important a part of the process as the walking on water? See, I believe it was. I believe that Peter's sinking was not something that took God by surprise. God knew it. I think it took Peter by surprise, but that's the point. Peter didn't think he was going to sink. But Jesus knew where Peter's faith was really at. So I think the sinking was just as important a part of the process and the learning journey that Peter and the other disciples in the boat were on as much as Peter walking on the water. Why did you doubt? Do you think Jesus asked that question to Peter because Jesus genuinely wanted an answer? Peter, I'm, I was, I'm wondering, you're walking on the water and I'm... I thought you would, and then you start sinking. And I'm like, what? I'll help you up, and I'm going to ask you a question. What did you doubt? Peter, can you teach me something? <laughs> Peter, can you teach me something? Why did you doubt? Nah, I don't think Jesus ever asked anyone a question because he didn't have the right information at his fingertips. I think Jesus asked the question because he wanted Peter to think about it. How many of you know that we don't think about things like that when we're on top of the mountain? Because we're just enjoying life, loving life, loving everything. When we go through those difficulties, I think God wants us to ask the question. It's a moment to self-reflect. It's a moment to think. I wonder how, how, how much further on. Can you imagine being Peter in that situation, getting out on the water, walking, sinking. Jesus pulls you up. You get back into the boat. Can you imagine what was running through Peter's mind when Jesus actually said that to him? And everybody in that boat, they heard it. Uh, uh, oh, you have little faith. Why would you doubt? The tables have turned a little bit. Peter's no longer the hero of the story. Now he's like the little boy that's been caught with his hand in the cookie jar. He's just been exposed who he really is, where his faith's really at, all that stuff. I wonder how long, how many chapters into the journey did he continue to think about that question? Why did I doubt? Why did I doubt? Most of us doubt because we don't have a proper understanding of faith in the character and nature of God. See, our faith rests in God's character and nature, rests in who he is, not what he does. It, it should rest in who God is, and the more we understand who God is, the more we understand in the good or the bad, the situation in my life may have changed, God didn't. My circumstance may have changed, God didn't. My feelings may have changed, God didn't. My emotions may have changed, God didn't. The outcome may have changed, God didn't. God didn't no matter what we're going through. God doesn't change, and I think that's a great message. And I think that's something that we can hang on to going through these times. I wonder how much of, of this season of COVID, what is God trying to show you about you and trying to show you about him and where your faith is really at, how you really see him, what you really think of him, what, 
what, to what degree do we actually trust that he is in control? It's one thing to say God's in control when life's going sweet and you're getting the outcomes you want and you're comfortable. and everything. But, but hey, can you truly fall back on the control of God? Throw your hands in the air and go, God, life sucks at the moment. I'm not getting to do what I want to do. I can't go where I want. But God, I want you to know at the end of the day, this is taking me by surprise. It's not taking you by surprise. And God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I trust you, Lord. I trust what you're doing, even when I don't understand it. To develop faith the way God wants us to have faith, it requires that we see God the way he wants us to see him. Faith is trusting that God is in control and not feeling like you are. Let me say that again. Faith is trusting that God is in control and not always having to feel like you are. And doesn't that describe the current world in which we live? I, I love the book of Job. Uh, there's so much uh, gold in the book of Job. And, and we all know the story. don't need to go into it. Here's a man, his business, his family, his whole world is turned upside down. And for 42 odd chapters, I think it is, 42, 43 chapters, um, here is Job and he's contemplating and he's thinking. Here's, here's what I like about it. He's thinking about his faith, he's thinking about his life, he's thinking about who he is and he has people that come around him and he, he debates back and forth with them, he has conversations with God. Job is just very real in that moment. And, and, and so it's basically uh, 40 odd chapters or whatever of a man who's actually, actually asking the question and thinking about, okay God, what is going on? here where am i really at it's a beautiful beautiful book where am i really at and i love uh, the end of it towards the back end job 42 and verse 5 here's what job says after going through everything job went through having his life stripped back bare, having everything taken away from him and here's what job says in job 42 verse 5 he says this he says i have heard of you by the hearing of the ear but now my eye sees you i've Heard of you by the hearing of the ear. You know, how many of you, you can come to church every week, you can pick up your Bible, you can listen to podcasts and YouTube channels and so on, and you can hear by the hearing of the ear, and you can say, I know God by the hearing of the ear, I've heard of him. But when you get in a moment where you need to put into practice or you need to depend on or lean on or trust what you've heard about him, that's another story, isn't it? It's a totally different story. And I love what Job teaches us here. Job says this. He says, I heard about you. I knew stuff about you. But it wasn't until I stood firm. It wasn't until I went through all the pressure of life and I kept my eyes on you and I got to the point where I realized, God, at the end of the day, I am not in control. This is not about me. I'm not the one that's meant to be glorified. I'm not the center of the universe. I'm not the hero of the story. God, that all belongs to you. And when Job came to that point, we know the end of the story. He was restored and, 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 and family and business and everything. And he ended up with all these great outcomes. But what's most uh, impressive to me is not the outcomes and what his life looked like, but it was what he learned on the inside. He said that, that I heard about you, but now I've actually experienced you. Now I've experienced you because I went through the tough time and I stood firm and I learned to trust you when I weren't getting the outcomes I wanted, when I wasn't getting the comfort I wanted, when everything wasn't going my way, but I trusted you. I stood firm and I trusted you. And I learnt what faith was through the process of the pressure. I wonder how many of us right now are learning what faith is through the process of the pressure. If we're honest, we learn more about ourselves and our faith in God through the difficult times than we ever do on a mountaintop and that's just the truth we really question ourselves or god when life's comfortable when we're getting what we want and when the outcome is what we hope for now some interesting things about pressure pressure can burst a water pipe pressure can pop a balloon pressure can burst a blood vessel in your body as Daniel shown us a few times on Sundays, too much pressure can bust a guitar string. But pressure can also turn a piece of coal into a diamond. It can turn a piece of coal into a diamond. I read this quote, I can't tell you who it's from. But he said this, remember, diamonds are created under pressure, so hold on. Soon it'll be your time to shine. Diamonds are created under pressure, so hold on, because pretty soon it's going to be your time to shine. You know, 
the disciples had just come out of a moment where they saw Jesus feed 5,000 people. What would you have come out of that having learnt about yourself and about God? If you had just been there with Jesus, seeing 5,000 people uh, fed. I'll tell you what, you're probably like me and you'll probably read some of these stories in the Bible and go, man, if I was there and I saw that, I would never doubt again. Well, these guys did. And they continued to doubt time after time after time. Jesus did all kinds of miracles, all kinds of signs and wonders, met all kinds of needs, and they continued to doubt. They've just walked away from seeing 5,000 people fed. And here's what they said at the end of the story. Jesus grabs Peter, pulls him up, gets in the boat. And in verse 33, 32, it says, And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. It's interesting, the wind ceased after Jesus had taught the lesson that the wind and waves were meant to teach them. As soon as they learnt the lesson. How do I know they learnt the lesson? Well, here's what they said in verse 33. Then those who were in the boat, they came and they worshipped him. And they said, truly, you are the son of God. In other words, we saw you feed 5,000 people and we learnt something about you. We grew a little bit. We trusted you a little bit. But there was something about going through a storm that exacerbated their growth. There's something about going through pressure that fast tracks the growth period of our faith. And they worshipped and declared he was truly, truly God. Pressure is probably our friend if we understand what God wants to do in the midst of the pressure. So let's admit who we really are. If you're seeing who you really are right now, why don't you humble yourself and admit it? See, God already sees it. Maybe the pressure's there because God wants you to see what he sees so that together you can walk on a journey and become who you're meant to become. And not only admit who you really are, but why don't you start to accept who God really is? Because he really is the healer, the deliverer. He really is the God who is in control. He really is the God who is all-knowing. He really is the God who is all-sufficient. He really is the God who is all-capable. He really is, he really is, he really is all those things that you tell yourself and believe and preach and say when you're on top of the mountain. He's all those things. It's not determined by whether you're on the mountain or in the valley. He is who he is because God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So take courage no matter what you're going through today. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let's admit who we really are, let's accept who God really is, and let's begin together to shine like diamonds, amen? Let me pray. Father, thank you for this morning or whatever time people are watching this. And Lord, I, I know that, uh, God, you have a purpose in pressure, but I'm also smart enough to know pressure doesn't feel good. And uh, Lord, there are people going through all kinds of pressure right now. And Father, I pray that you would achieve your purpose through the pressure. God, would you use the pressure? Would you draw their attention to not what the pressure is, but to what is God capable of doing in the midst of this pressure? What can you show us about ourselves? What can you show us about our faith and our relationship with you that we can take into the future? God, so that we can shine like mighty diamonds in the kingdom of God and in the places where you have planted us, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody at home said... Amen. God bless you.